you know, when we were campaigning in Massachusetts, everybody I know was like, everybody I know who was out there, including Alex, you know, including my wife, Dania, we were just, we were like, oh, he's going to win Massachusetts, right? We, we, because every time you spoke to anybody, you know, you just had, there was a lot of positivity about Bernie and, you know, we would meet supporters and we were the only campaign that was really out there. So I know Alex did some um, canvassing right around Warren's home because we always understood Massachusetts to be Warren versus Bernie, right? Mm. Um, and, you know, Alex did some canvassing right by Warren's home. And, um, you know, he did like 13 houses and found, six, you know, six Bernie supporters and one Warren or something. You know, it, and I've never been as wrong as as I was about the Massachusetts result. Like when it came in for Biden, we were just open mouthed um, because, you know, it just wasn't our experience on the doorsteps. So I just, you know, I can't think where I was going with this. But, you know, you maybe ask Alex about that when you have him on, because it was very instructive just to be so wrong about something. You know, it's like when the UK election was going on, you know, I'm patting myself on the back because, you know, oh, I thought it'd be a Labour collapse. Mm. You know, in a way, I feel like you learn more from being wrong than being right, you know? As we figure um, out all the time, yeah. <laughs> I, was, I was about to say, like, I've never actually experienced that, so I don't know uh... what <laughs> Hello, welcome to Alpha Bunga Bunga, the global politics podcast at the end of the end of history. My name is Alex Hochley. I'm in Sao Paulo, Brazil, as per usual. And just before we go any further, you'll have heard our guest there in the cold open refer to an Alex. That won't be me. That'll be Alex Gurevich, who's a friend of the podcast, uh, past guest and soon to be future guest. Uh, so now you know who uh, we were referring to. He gets a reference later on. Anyway, hi, Alex. Uh, right, so to the rest of us, uh, George Hoare. George Hoare's in London. Hiya, George. Hey, so we just missed the uh, clap for the NHS. So that was the second successive week that we'd had that, and it was uh, as loud, if not louder, uh, than the first week. So we, w- we won't be disrupted by external noise. That's what that's what I'm saying. Right, yeah, no, I mean, got- if it, uh, my, my external noise would have been uh, kind of the backdrop to this, if we were recording a couple of hours later, would be... Not so much claps, but uh, the banging of pots and pans, playing of vuvuzelas and so on, uh, protesting Bolsonaro, which happens at 8 in the evening every night. Uh, maybe you should try to capture that for another episode. It'll be a ni- nice little bit of color. <laughs> anyway, and uh, Phil Cunliffe uh, is in Canterbury, as usual, as well. Hey, how's it going? So no clapping here for the NHS, oddly, because there was quite a bit of clapping last week. Uh, this week, no clapping. And the question lingering in the back of my mind is, when are we going to be expected to start clapping for the cops? Because if this goes on uh, for weeks and weeks, it might get to that point too. So, anyway. what what about clapping for podcasters who keep us all entertained? Yeah, no, actually, That's... I think that 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 is worth a clap. Actually. We just we just need order of priorities to be correct. I might just stick in a little um, audio clip that I'll find on the internet of, of just random applause, just right there, just to, <laughs> just to give ourselves a pat on the back. <laughs> Um, you, should, you should also leave in this explanation of you doing it. As <laughs> yeah, well. absolutely. Yeah. Um, right. Let me explain what we're doing here because we are going to be discussing the US election, and you've probably heard a bunch of podcasts about the US election. Uh, what we hope this is is the first in a semi regular series of episodes on the US election. And of course, uh, you know, every man and his dog has a podcast that's been discussing the election since the last one pretty much came to an end. And we ourselves have been avoiding doing it a little bit just because, well, I, we don't want to feed into the perm election circus. Uh, people are well catered for with other podcasts, many of whom are our friends and do a good job of it. Uh, what we want to do now, and we, we've decided to wait until, you know, a couple months before the election to actually start delving into it, uh, it's to provide our own angle on things try to take a global view uh, as outsiders and maybe do things which stay away from the hubbub of he said he said and she said of the election reporting and the infinite polling that goes on uh we're not we don't want to provide a kind of you know little update every time and say you know someone's at 25 percent and someone's blah 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 of course we're recording this uh on the 2nd of april so um a lot of 
water has gone under the bridge uh, in terms of the the election primaries, but there's still a lot to be discussed. Um, to help us do this, we have today Nick Frain. Uh, hi, Nick. How's it going? Hi, guys. Uh, very well, thank you. And um, I'm very happy to be on my second favorite podcast today. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Uh, yeah, no, that's we don't anyway, need to know what the first. Favorite. Yeah, we don't. Yeah, don't. Yeah, shouldn't mention any any names really. Um, you can mention your third favorite podcast if you like, but but not. <laughs> um, so Nick, Nick is a, an attorney and has been volunteering with the Bernie Sanders campaign in Rhode Island. Um, he's going to explain a little bit of his background in just a second. Um, but as I said. We're recording this on the 2nd of April. I say that just to provide a little bit of context in case something insane happens in the world, uh, more insane than what is already happening, <laughs> just to put that in context in case we happen not to mention something. Um, but I think that the most important context, perhaps, uh, you know, in, in relation to coronavirus is that today, at least, it's been announced that 6.6 .6 million are seeking unemployment insurance. And that is sadly expected to continue ballooning up to and perhaps beyond 20 million. I think that's a very, perhaps possibly the most important contextual note to make. Right, enough context. Uh, I'm going to hand over to Phil now. Thanks. Um, so before we get stuck in, Nick, uh, it would be helpful to our listeners if you told us a little bit about yourself, your background and how you came to volunteer for the Bernie campaign. Um, so what is your role exactly in the campaign? And also um, just to ask about the accent as well, because it's a part podcast of weird accents usually our guests don't have weird accents so it's the it's the podcast it's us who have the weird accent so if you could maybe tell us how you got the accent too mm -hmm. i think i think i got it from the same weird accent store where you got yours <laughs> <laughs> my accent isn't weird but okay so um i think it, so i don't have an official role with a campaign i i mean like tens tens of thousands of others um i'm a volunteer for the campaign um and specifically uh, I've been active in the campaign probably for the last five or six months now. Specifically, um, I have helped to organize Rhode Island for Bernie Sanders, which is a local um, grassroots, independent um, organization here in Rhode Island. Rhode Island is the smallest state in the union. It's just south of Massachusetts um, that has been organizing campaign activities for Bernie in the state. Um, but also we've done a lot of um, travel to the earlier states, so New Hampshire and then Massachusetts prior to Super Tuesday um, to engage in door knocking or similar. And we've kind of mobilized Rhode Islanders to do that work. And how did you, so how did you, um, I mean, what brought you to volunteering for, um, for Bernie's campaign? Yeah, so um, I should have said, actually, I'm a, and this relates to the accent, of course, I'm a naturalized American citizen. I came here in 2003. Um, and, you know, I had actually come from, uh, a, from a kind of radical left tradition in the UK from when I was very young. Um, so, you know, and that was a tradition that was uh, less focused on electoral politics. So it was a tradition that was really about, understood itself to be building movements, um, building political coalitions um, that could bring about you know, potentially revolutionary change um, in, in the British context. And so I'd always been, uh, having come from that tradition, I'd always been fairly skeptical about electoral politics. Um, and perhaps we can get into this more in a bit, um, but, you know, and I'd remain skeptical uh, having arrived in the United States. So um, actually 2016 was the first election in which I ever tried to cast a vote um, in the Democratic primary for Bernie Sanders. Um, so, uh, you know, I think I'm not unusual in, in amongst Bernie volunteers um, in that this is my first like really substantial engagement um, with electoral politics in the United States. So how, how true would that be of the people that you work with most directly in the campaign then? If you had to kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, guess or make an educated guess as to what proportion of them are first time, kind of have first time involvement with electoral politics? Well, I don't want to, um, you know, put out anic data. But what I will say is this, um, that what is really striking is that uh, many of these people's most significant political experience up until this point 
was the 2016 campaign. Uh, so one of the first um, big uh, events that we organized here in Rhode Island was um, a kind of rally in Providence. I mean, it was a mixture of rally. We also had local bands playing um, and a lot of political speeches. And it was really striking to me. We had a lot of um, either local elected officials who were endorsing Bernie or um, current candidates for elected positions um, in Rhode Island. So they're local, you know, they're running for state government, they're running for, you know, city council, or they're already city councillors in one of the many towns and cities around Rhode Island, or they're already in the state legislature. Uh, and of those people, the overwhelming majority, um, are, they're very young, typically, and their first significant political experience was the 2016 campaign, or if they're you know, uh, on the younger side, the kind of um, legacy of that campaign, which was organizations like Our Revolution um, that looked for progressive um, candidates to run in local and some national elections. And of course, that's the movement um, that uh, uh, or I think it was Justice Democrats, which is an analogous um, organization that won AOC or at least backed AOC in her primary um, uh, victory over Joe Crowley. So Nick, I guess the, the question um, emerges from this, if this is your first foray into um, electoral politics, is, is Bernie, why? Because I think a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of people might be yeah. coming from a similar background and what what made you, I guess, you know, take take the leap and think um, this was a this was a campaign to get involved with. Yeah, I I think it's you know obviously with any individual decision, of course, there's personal um, as well as political reasons, right? These things are never purely intellectual. Um, but what I would say is that for me, the message of Bernie, and this really became clear to me in 2016, was fundamentally different from um, any any from the message of any. Um, political uh, um, campaign for, you know, maybe 30 years. In that um, vision of change was about mass mobilization, right? His vision of change was not technocratic. Uh, it was actually about organizing people um, to um, uh, become engaged in the political process and, you know, uh, ideally, as a function of that, to reach new voters who have felt excluded or marginalized from or, you know, are cynical about the political process. And for me, that that vision of change, the fact that Bernie understood and, you know, I would, I would describe that as it's a very political vision. Right. So as opposed to a technocratic, mm. it's a Democrat, Democratic political vision of how politics should work. And for me, that was a significant enough break with the, um, you know, with our existing politicians and the, essentially the mainstream Democrats, but also, of course, the Republican Party um, that, you know, it, it, it inspired me to to um, get involved in this. Interesting. I mean, if you'd said it was Bernie's 2016 um, uh, campaign ad with the Simon and Garfunkel track and uh, um, backing it, then I would have I would have understood that as well. But I guess it's, they're two sides of the same coin. Yeah. That kind of Bernie is a movement politician. Mm -hmm. It's us, you know. It's not me, and that yeah. that kind of emotional appeal as well. Yeah, and I think I just want to say something about that "us not me" slogan, which I, you know, at, at first, I think it, it, you know, there's two ways we can understand that slogan, right? There's a kind of um, uh, it, there's a, you could understand it as a kind of altruistic um, message, right? Which is, oh, it's not about, you know, and this would be one way to understand it. It's not about this selfish individual, me. It's about all of those other people. And, you know, this is something we can come back to. And, and I think, you know, that interpretation would trouble me a little because that would remind me of the uh, front page of the Daily Mirror just before the most recent British election where I believe they posted, and I, I think I... Uh, picked this up from your podcast, actually, they posted a, a picture of homeless people and said, do it for them, right? Um, but I think there's another way to understand it, yeah. which is Bernie is saying, no, it's not, a, it's not me. You're not electing me, right? It's actually about us and what we can do 
um, together, right? What we can do when we unite. And I think, you know, that that's, a, but I do think that's a tension in the campaign, right? And we can come back to that. I think, you know, maybe that's kind of heightened since COVID particularly. Um, but I think that that may be, you know, those two readings of that one slogan, um, you know, may highlight a kind of potential tension in the campaign. So before we, okay, so, I mean, we'll, so we will come back to the, um, the tension within the slogan. Um, and just so, and before we get kind of um, stuck in deeper, is just to then, can you remind us about the current state of play with the Democratic primaries? I mean, so much of um, US politics and reporting of US politics abroad has been overwhelmed by the COVID-19 crisis. Yeah. It would be useful just to remind ourselves and our listeners about who's in, who's out, what the delegate count currently looks like and um, all of that. So um, right now, the I, I was, the delegate campaign count, so this is primaries that have happened so far. Um, and of course, you know, actually, it's just interesting, uh, just a, a slight tangent. Um, the Republican primary uh, works a, a, as a winner-takes-all system, right? So if you get a majority of votes in the state or a plurality of votes in the state, um, you win the state, right? So each state essentially counts as one. The Democratic primary um, uh, works on a delegate count. So you are assigned delegates as a proportion, um, you know, depending on the proportion of vote that you win in the states. Um, so I think that has a tendency to keep it relatively close. So actually, uh, uh, as of now, Biden has uh, 1,215 votes, 1,215, sorry, delegates. And Bernie has 909 delegates. Um, and there are still, in the upcoming primaries, uh, 1,700, so 1,755 delegates still to be awarded. So it, and it, to actually um, have an outright majority at the convention, you would need about, uh, well, this is the number, uh, 1,991 delegates to win. So... You know, it's actually, you know, the, the, the actual margin is not that significant. But of course, in order to overcome it, Bernie would need to win a huge um, percentage of the remaining delegates, around 63%. Um, and just, uh, you know, just uh, by what, to put that number in perspective, his kind of signature win was Nevada, um, in which he won 46.8% of the vote. So... Um, you know, it, it, the odds are stacked against him. So, I mean, there's obviously so much that might change in the next couple of months. And even though Biden uh, has a substantial lead and is in an enviable uh, position, really, in terms of his support from the Democratic Party establishment, I think the fact that so many things can change is probably worth still going through these questions about thinking about Bernie 2020 and not the Bernie movement and all these other questions which we're going to come on to, but specifically the Bernie 2020 question. How distinctive, I think maybe more, more just in terms of setting this up so as we have a basis to then uh, go on to further questions, how distinctive is Bernie's proposition, uh, both in contrast to other candidates as well as compared to you know recent history? Because, um, I mean, just to spell that a little bit further, I guess, most people, I guess most people who listen to this are either really pro-Bernie or are to the left of that and are a bit skeptical of the limitations of the Democratic Party or of electoral politics and so on. Um, obviously, listeners, if you <laughs> completely disagree with that depiction of you, uh, please mail in and and, uh, and tell us to shut up and tell us we're wrong. Um, but, uh, but, you know, most people would, would probably understand Bernie's campaign as being distinctive from the rest of them. But if we flash back to a year ago, there were people saying, well, you know, Bernie and Warren are, you know, twin candidacies. Bernie's is better, but Warren's is also good. So maybe if you could try to sp sp split the wheat from the yeah. chaff there. or Yeah, I mean, uh, so I think, you know, it's, it's very interesting, right? In terms, I think we can distinguish here between policies and politics. Because one of the fascinating things about the early debates when, and I, you know, I don't know why anybody you know, outside of the US, and indeed, I don't know why anybody in the US would really watch them, but I did. Um, in those early debates, when you had just this, this crowd of candidates on the stage, 
what was so remarkable was just how far the discussion had moved since 2016 and obviously had been moved by Bernie's 2016 run. So, you know, you saw candidates who were trying to distinguish themselves um, by, you know, by their particular takes on universal health care, um, as opposed to just the idea of universal health care per se. Um, so what what was clear was in terms of policy, you know, the, the policy, at least early on, um, was not what distinguished the campaign. So I think Elizabeth Warren was his closest um, rival in terms of, you know, this kind of left platform. I think what was really interesting about Warren's campaign was what, that their slogan, I think, or I don't know if it was an official slogan, um, but it was her kind of catchphrase was, I've got a plan for that. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously that spoke to, to me at least, that spoke to a very kind of technocratic vision of politics. So, uh, in the end, yeah, of the- I think I think that was uh, borne out by the the image of the Warren supporter as well. People who loved plans, fetishized plans. Um, yeah. Very yeah, striking. No. Also, so many academics that I know um, who are kind of um, involved in U.S. politics or U.S. voters, U.S. citizens were really enamored of um, Elizabeth Warren. I was actually quite struck by that. I was surprised by how popular she was among um, middle class academic, um, well, American middle classes, essentially. People who love plans. Yeah. I, mean, I think also, you know, maybe we can come back to this. You know, one of the things this campaign has made me appreciate is 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 the kind of sociological dimension of politics. Um, and, you know, maybe I'm, this is unique to me, but I feel like, um, you know, especially not having been involved in these kind of electoral battles, you know, for in the past, um, I was struck by how much, you know, how sociology plays such a kind of key role um, in the outcomes of elections. I mean, maybe this is a really kind of facile point to make, but I think, you know, I've often sat there yelling at the telly, why don't you say it like this? You know, why don't you make this point? If only you could put your point, you know, like X, then it would be so much more convincing in a kind of logical sense. Um, but I think, you know, that ignores all of this kind of sociological dimension to people's experience and what they, and what they um, you know, will be persuaded by. And I think, you know, when I see Warren, you know, I'm a lawyer, um, you know, I've also taught in a law school um, uh, over the last five years. So, you know, I could really see why people, um, you know, people identified with her. Um, and, you know, she's certainly very coherent, um, highly credible. Um, but I think, you know, what's missing for me, of course, was I, I believe that's, that's a completely different political vision from, um, you know, the one that Sanders was offering. So can you tell us a little bit about how the campaign has gone? Um, You've mentioned um, you mentioned a few moments. You mentioned the tension in the slogan. You've mentioned um, the the young crowd that has been drawn in either in 2016 or more recently. Um, Mm -hmm. Are there any other kind of standout moments for you from the campaign trail that gave you particular insight or understanding and maybe particularly connected with what you were just saying about the link between um, the political framing, the political vision, and the sociology of those listening. Yeah. So, um, you know, I've learned a lot from from doorstepping in the campaign. Um, you know, from from actual uh, door to door canvassing. Um, and you know, I think that. So, and I started canvassing first in New Hampshire, um, which voted early. Uh, so, um, if I think back to, you know, my kind of particularly significant moments. I remember there was one point I was standing in um, in, in a trailer park, right? So this is a, a, a housing development, which is essentially, um, you know, what you call in England, you call it a caravan, right? Um, so these are mobile homes, uh, but they've been parked in a particular development. And then, of course, you know, they don't, they're no longer on wheels, they're on blocks, but, you know, it's a, obviously a very um, cheap uh, uh, you know, very affordable um, mode of housing for people. Um, and I was thinking, you know, it, and it was quite hostile. So I was walking around it, you know, obviously it doesn't help. It's very cold up in New Hampshire in the winter. So, you know, this obviously affects Host, the mood. Hostile, hostile how? Uh, 
Well, so I was, you know, knocking on doors and um, I wasn't getting, you know, great responses, right? There was um, certainly, uh, I, I experienced a strong feeling of kind of cynicism, um, but also um, detachment. So, you know, that was, I believe it was uh, the day before the primary. It might have even been the day of the primary itself. Um, and, you know, people were very um, wary. People were very wary, um, you know, and didn't particularly want to engage. So, you know, I would meet, don't get me wrong, I'll meet Sanders supporters, very enthusiastic, typically very warm. Um, you know, he had a high level of commitment. So if we break down the Sanders vote, you know, people who decide, uh, decided early on in the um, election process uh, tend, you know, or rather Sanders voters tended to decide early on in the election process that they were going to vote for Sanders. Um, so they have a high level of, level of commitment. Obviously, great enthusiasm when you go and knock on their door. Uh, what I found was the, the non-Sanders supporters, you know, or at least people who were either unwilling to engage um, you know, perhaps their, their Trump support, well, not the Trump supporters so much, but unwilling to engage with me. Um, you know, I felt a kind of cynicism and distrust. So can, look, and, can I just jump in to ask for a bit of clarification? Because, I mean, I mean, New Hampshire, if I recall correctly, is a sort of semi-open primary, right? Anybody can vote as long as it's not a Republican in a, in a Democratic primary. So, I mean, are you going around and you're talking to people who are Democrats? I mean, obviously, New Hampshire, you're talking to potentially anybody um, other than registered Republicans, but also maybe thinking about some of the other states. Uh, I don't know if you it happened to campaign in one which was a closed primary, what it, whether there's a difference in talking to people in general or, and going and being like, oh, are you a registered Democrat and what is your perspective? Did you find a difference there? So for the most part, the canvassing we did was um, voter rolls of identified Democrats or independents. Um, but of course, when you start knocking on the doors, you know, the roles are not, um, uh, you know, real time updated. So, of course, you meet a wide variety of people. So I met Trump voters. Interestingly, the Trump voters were not particularly hostile. And That's interesting. Um, yeah, very hard to know. Um, you know, again, this is pure anecdata, right? Very hard to know. But I sometimes felt there was a kind of some some sympathy for Bernie amongst the Trump voters, um, you know, did, which did you flip which, any? No, no. <laughs> at, at this, you, know, you, you never do on the on the doorstep. Uh, you know, ten minutes exactly. conversation. They're not going to say, "Ah, yeah, you've changed my entire <laughs> political theory." Exactly. I mean, no matter no matter how skilled an orator you are, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I think people get, you know, in fairness, people do get into some substantive conversations. But I think, you know, particularly um, with that late canvassing, a lot of that is more focused on getting out the vote, right? So, you know you're not necessarily looking to engage um, at length. But what, anyway, what I would say is, you know, I sometimes felt with the, maybe a moment of recognition with the Trump, with the Trump voters, which was, um, you know, their, their man is an outsider, right? And they understand that you too are campaigning for an outsider. Um, and, you know, that, that moment of identification is maybe borne out by some of Trump's kind of more, you know, rather sympathetic tone when he talks about crazy Bernie. Um, but uh, what I was to go back to the trailer park, I think where, where I was coming to was, you know, I grew up in the UK where you would go onto housing estates that were that are just universally labor supporters. Right. So, um, you know, I lived in Manchester when I was growing up. You know, there would be whole neighborhoods where you only saw labor posters come election time. And it was interesting to me. That, that that kind of contrast struck me that, you know, these are working class voters, um, you know, who one might hope would be supportive of a candidate who is highly focused on workplace conditions, right, union rights, um, and, and also basic welfare provision. Um, and it was, it, but, it, but it was telling to me because Obviously, we were kind of parachuting into this neighborhood you know, relatively late in the game. I mean, you know, in fairness to the campaign, there was people organizing in New Hampshire for a long time. Um, but, you know, it's a matter of months, not years. Uh, and it, I think what I was struck was by the what, what I was struck by was uh, 
the difference between mobilizing for an election, right? This is a mobilization to get people out to vote and the kind of long-term organizing that might create a neighborhood where everybody supports a particular candidate. Um, and I don't know if there's any way, you know, I don't think within the confines of the, an electoral campaign, there's necessarily a way to overcome that gap. But uh, I also think that points to the, just the mountain that had to be climbed um, in this particular electoral campaign. Could you, just before we move on, just, and I'm very curious, um, could you kind of give, um, you know, what did, how did the cynicism, the disenchantment, the, um, you know, the hostility, how was it expressed? What did people say if they spoke to you at all? How did you ever try to, um, did you ever try to kind of win, win some of them back or persuade some of them um, to come out and vote anyway? How did, how did it go down with the, with the cynical, disenchanted um, potential voters? Yeah. And I should say, actually, I don't just mean, you know, maybe hostile is wrong, but cynical is really the word I would use. So just to give you another example, just before Super Tuesday, I think it, actually this was Super Tuesday. I was canvassing in a town called New, a city called New Bedford, which is um, southern Massachusetts. Uh, it's um, right on the on the south coast of Massachusetts and it's a former industrial town. You know, it's it's essentially like a, a New England Rust Belt. And I was in an apartment building and I got talking with this guy, opened the door. Um, you know, I don't know if it's significant, but there was just an enormous waft of marijuana smoke as he opened the door. And I started talking to him, you know, primaries today, you know, you are, he, you know, I had a voter role. He's, reg he's registered as a voter, not actually registered as a Democrat. Um, you know, uh, are you planning to vote? So got talking. And and he, you know, I started saying, I'm here from the Sanders campaign. He said, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to vote. I'm not going to vote. And he said, um, you know, after all, he said, but if I was going to vote, I, I would vote for Bernie. He, You know, I support Bernie. But I, if I was going to vote, I would vote for Bernie. And of course, it was incredibly frustrating, right? Because I'm, I'm standing here with somebody who could vote, right? And actually supports the candidate that I am shilling for. So just to, to, just to your point, Phil, yeah, I mean, absolutely. Like I was absolutely, you know, I was absolutely engaging as, to the extent that they would allow me with everybody I spoke to, right? So, you know, I'm a very, I'm a lawyer, right? So I love to talk. Um, and, uh, you know, I would engage, I would argue with people, you know, and, and, uh, but more than argue with people, you know, and I found this very effective on the doorstep in terms of getting pe talk, people talking, is, you know, really listen to people, right? And this is a big thing with the campaign and, and, and you know, it's a credit to them. Campaign was very focused on ask people what issues are most important to them. And I have to say, just, just that exercise, right? Just that exercise of saying to people on the doorstep, you know, what's the most important thing to you was very revealing because um, uh, people would open up. Right. In a way, you know, you might have someone who opened the door in a slightly hostile manner. But when you when you, you know, ask them, well, what are the issues that really matter to you? Um, you know, they they will start to open up. And actually what was apparent was, you know, some surprise at actually being asked for their opinion. So New Bedford, Southern Massachusetts. Right. We saw no other canvases in that town. That's a substantial, you know, town, city. Um, I'm not sure what its exact status is. That's a substantial urban conurbation um, with a lot of potential voters. And we were the only campaign that I saw that was um, doorstepping or even active um, at all in New Bedford. What did, so what did people say when you when you ask them what what do they want? What are their what are the things they care about? What do they what kind of things do they tell you? So um, you know. The, the big things are, well, we can come back to this. Probably the number one um, is beating Trump. I just want someone, you know, we've got to get this guy out of the warehouse, uh, out of the White House, sorry. Uh, uh, but close second, and, and you know, I, again, anecdata, right? I'm not sure which was the, the leader, um, was healthcare, right? People are very um, focused on this issue. 
Um, and of course, that was great to hear that on the doorstep because then you could talk a bit about your candidate. But to go back to my man who was, um, you know, came to the door, uh, there was young kids running around in the apartment, you know, big waft of smoke. He uh, and a Bernie supporter, right, at least in a very, very passive way, right? So passive that he's literally not going to go to the polling station that's, you know, two blocks away. Um, you know, it just struck me that, like, there was probably nothing I could stay on the doorstep that day that was going to get that man to the polls, right? There was no, um, you know, act of, uh, um, you know, uh, advocacy. There was no speech I could give that he was going to get him to go from his department mm. to the polls. And, so, and, and it's sorry, just, to, just to, just to yeah. jump in here, because I think this is really um, related to an interview that we did with Jennifer Silver about the 2016 yeah. election um, and the kind of anti-political perspective, the cynicism of a lot of working class voters or working class non-voters that, that she talked to. And of course, that encapsulated in the choice which they saw between president sellout and president dickhead and they went for the for the latter in 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 2016 or the country as a whole did um so i guess this this actually maybe raises some some big questions about you know last time what what happened last time what happened in 2016 why why was it that bernie ended up losing to hillary um was it a mistake that he went on to endorse her um, and then a question which comes out from that is, do you think that Bernie will endorse Biden? I mean, that's obviously quite speculative, but what would have things changed or are we in a in a fairly similar situation? So, George, take your last point first, which was um, about whether Biden, uh, whether uh, Bernie would eventually endorse Biden. Yeah. I don't believe there's any speculation there at all. Um, uh, I am absolutely, you know, Bernie has said repeatedly that he will back whoever wins the candidacy. Of course, you know, I just want to say for the record here, you know, he's the candidate that that gets put to above and beyond anybody else, right? So there's this constant questioning right. of Bernie's loyalty to the party. We can cabin that as another, um, you know, uh, uh, another discussion, maybe another part of the discussion. Um, but, you know, he is he, he is loyal to the Democratic Party, right? Although, um, you know, arguably they are not loyal to him, right? He is loyal to the Democratic Party. Um, and, you know, I think there's a tension there. So I don't know if you know, um, there's a comedian, Jimmy Dore, who now does this. I think he was part of Young Turks, maybe the Young Turks TV show. Uh, he's no, a big not, not familiar. Okay. He's a big Tulsi guy. And he um, uh, had, appeared on a podcast. It was a, the same one that Joe Rogan. So he appeared with Joe Rogan. And I remember him saying, why does Bernie always get on the stage and put his hand on Joe Biden and keep saying, my friend Joe? You know, my friend Joe. Every time in the debate, it was my friend Joe says this, you know. Or even if he's criticizing him, right, even if he's talking about the billionaire donors to Joe Biden, He's got his hand on Joe Biden and he's saying, you know, my friend Joe. And and I think that 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 resonated for me because, you know, I, I think perhaps because of the tradition that I come from, you know, I'm 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 uh, I'm, I'm always waiting for him to throw these people under the bus. Right. But you want him I, to put his hand on his shoulder so he's then going to shove him over, ideally under a bus. So. I so I think if I think about, you know, but but was that a problem with the campaign? Right. Because it's a separate question. Look, this is what I want Bernie to do. Right. But, you know, and this is something my wife also a big Bernie supporter. She's always telling me you have to trust his political judgment. Right. He's been involved in politics for a long time. And I think and I was just thinking about this today. I think, look, there is he's this is maybe a problem with the campaign, but it's true. Nonetheless, he's running in the Democratic primary, right? He's running in the Democratic primary. And so um, when he is trying to appeal to voters in the Democratic primary, as we've already talked about, right, and Alex pointed out, there are open and closed primaries. There are people who are affiliated, you know, who are, who are not affiliated to any party who are voting in this primary. Instantly, you know, Bernie wins those, uh, wins in that group, the independent voters. Um, but the vast majority of people voting in this primary have some identification 
with the Democratic Party. And so if you want to win the Democratic Party, Party primary, I do think there's an argument to be made that um, you don't want to alienate the mainstream Democratic um, mm -hmm. base. Now, I just think that's a tactical question, right? I think that's a tactical question about how you, um, you know, go about trying to win that race. Um, you know, uh, what I, I mean, and what, I think... Can I, can yeah, I put it ahead. to you? Sorry to interrupt, but I mean, is it not more of a strategic question even? Because, you know, I'm I'm very excited. I like Bernie Sanders a lot as, as a politician. I think he has a lot of integrity. Uh, I think he can lead people. I'm very excited about the, as you said as well, you know, the, the politics even more than specifically the policies. But the problem always seemed to be this threading of the needle necessary uh, by of appealing to Democrats while at the same time being outside of it, um, of being anti-establishment while being, while not pissing off the establishment. And it seems what has happened is that he's ended up simultaneously too populist while not being populist enough, of being too left wing while not being left wing enough, and so on. You know, uh, uh, of basically not of, of not having the sort of anti-establishment energy and insurgent populist energy that he had in 2016, while at the same time not being able to satisfy the demands of Democrats. And I think Democrats, we have to be clear that these are not just uh, Democrats are are a particular beast, and they probably come in different stripes. But it's not just more politically engaged left-wing voters. That is not what Democrats, registered Democrats are, I think. So, um, I mean, I'm interested in your thoughts about whether you think that was always a possibility, whether it was indeed a possibility to, to thread that needle. And, and secondly, you know, maybe you could tell us who, who, who are Democrats? <laughs> maybe it's a silly sounding question, but who are they? Well, I think, um, you know, I think, well, okay, so to, to, to think about the strategic tactical question, um, you know, I don't know if you could thread that needle, really. I think that's created an attention within the campaign, right? And maybe the success or failure of the campaign, you know, uh, um, uh, rested on how well you could, um, how well you could kind of mediate that tension between the, uh, between maintaining a kind of cordial, although obviously, in fact, not cordial, um, but at least attempting to maintain a cordial relationship with the democratic establishment um, and maintaining that outsider status. And I think, you know, there's many on the left in the U.S., right, who would always have said you cannot push a kind of popular, you cannot push a working class platform within the Democratic Party. Um, so, you know, there's many who, who would never have engaged with the Democratic Party, right? There's many on the left who would never have engaged with the Democratic Party. And of course, Bernie himself, you know, not a Democrat, right? Originally not a Democrat. Um, you know, they had their, um, uh, uh, their particular Vermont party, um, you know, and then he sat in um, the House and then Senate originally as an independent. So, um, you know, and I, but I... I could it have been done more successfully? You know, would it have been better if he did what Jimmy Dore said um, and, you know, said from Biden under the bus, right? You know, actually said, you know, when um, uh, one of his surrogates, Zephyr Teachout, she's a lawyer, um, and Politico uh, wrote the op-ed in The Guardian that it talked about Biden's corruption program, uh, Biden's pro corruption, not program, but problem. Um, <laughs> That's a program too, I suppose. He's got a program. <laughs> it was pretty programmatic, Biden's corruption. Um, but, you know, Bernie made every effort to distance himself from that. Said, no, no, but, you know, Joe's not corrupt. You know, to me, when I look at this Burisma scandal, right, where, where Joe Biden's son sits on the board of this Ukrainian gas company, Burisma, um, you know, I, it, it might not be corruption in the legal sense of the word, but, you know, surely by any definition, that's exactly what we mean when we talk about political corruption, right? That is politicians peddling their influence um, to benefit themselves, you know, and in this case, their immediate families. It's actually everything that um, the Democrats want to talk about with Trump. So it would have been far more satisfying to me if Bernie had gone after Biden at that moment and said, yeah, absolutely. This is corruption. The question is, 
would that have benefited him in the Democratic primary? And that I actually don't think I have a particular answer to. And I think, you know, with any of these things, you know, maybe um, to, you know, use uh, Phil's um, famous analogy, right? It was either Phil or Hegel that talked about the owl of Minerva that flies at dusk. Um, and, you know, maybe it's something that we can only appreciate with the benefit of, um, of hindsight. I was just reading a postmortem on the campaign in the New York Times in which they identified the problem as Bernie was too aggressive with the Democratic establishment. So I just think at this, uh, you know, almost at this moment, it's very hard to know, um, you know, how the strategy um, could have worked differently. So I guess that segues nicely then into the question. The big question is, um, you know, uh, so your wife says, um, you know, you've got to trust kind of Bernie's democratic in, um, or political um, experience and political instincts. You're torn yourself as to um, how, you know, um, given the fact that he's competing in primary elections, how else could we expect him to behave? And that he um, he's trying to um, he's trying to win ultimately in a democratic primary. Nonetheless, how did it end up that he looking like he's or how it looking like he's going to lose um, to Biden? Because you said he's got like um, sig- he needs to make significant gains in order to pull abreast of bride Biden in advance of the Democratic convention. Yeah. So to go back to Alex's introduction, right, I don't want to write off the campaign because, you know, um, it's just really actually it's clear that anything can happen, right? Anything can happen in politics. And I think, um, you know, obviously if we had been asked to, you know, even in January or, or, or to talk about coronavirus, I don't think any of us would have expected to be where we are today. Um, so, you know, I just would think that is a big wild card in this process. So I, I certainly want to say, you know, this thing is over. And, and I, for one, I mean, I, you know, we uh, actually, our primary was pushed back. It was supposed to be April 28th. Uh, it's now June 2nd. And, you know, I, I, I fully intend to win uh, uh, Rhode Island for Bernie Sanders. Um, and, you know, I think actually we're going to do that. It's going it, to, it will be, both be, send a message, right? I think it's important that we send a message. Um, and I also think, you know, by actively campaigning, um, we're going to, um, you know, I think it, it, we can build the build some kind of foundation uh, and, and develop a legacy for the campaign that will, um, you know, be politically uh, um, uh, useful in other ways. So I don't want to say it's all over, mm. but I think, you know, if, if I have to say, um, uh, if I have to think about a particular um, factor that I think has made this campaign very difficult, um, I think, you know, it, I think when Trump was elected in 2016, I was very, very uh, demoralized. And not because, you know, I, I was particularly, cons- because I thought that Trump um, was particularly problematic, right? I didn't have the kind of, you know, so-called Trump derangement syndrome that I knew a lot of people were, uh, who were suffering from. Um, but I think my own concern was just because I, I arrived in the U.S. Um, in 2003 permanently. Uh, and so I was here for the 2004 election in which George Bush Jr. was reelected um, and then had to live through the anybody but Bush years. Right. So. Uh, so, you know, before that election, in the run up to that election, but then also afterwards, you know, of course, now. Uh, George Bush Jr. has been uh, rehabilitated to some extent, but that was a very, very um, frustrating time politically um, because we were stuck in this anybody but Bush logic. And I was concerned that the same thing was going to happen once Trump was elected, that the entire focus, right, it doesn't matter who they run in the Democratic primary in 2020, the focus will be all about um, you know, uh, vote blue, no matter who, um, and, um, you know, would really limit the, um, parameters of political debate. And I think to some extent, you know, um, 
Of course, we can come to in, inter, intrinsic reasons why the campaign lost, but I think externally that made it a very tough environment, right? Um, you know, I, I think it means it's an environment in which voters are, very, are somewhat cautious, right? Particularly this democratic establishment block um, is somewhat cautious, um, you know, and there's been a lot of propagandistic work done since 2016 to suggest that somehow Trump's election was not a failing of the Hillary campaign, right, but was actually the fault of the Sanders insurgent campaign against Hillary. So I do well, think... Well, that, 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 sorry to jump in, that just shows how, how little um, has been learned. I think one of the really, one of the really interesting challenges for tr that Trump was potentially facing in 2020 was what was his, what was his kind of central campaign message going to be? And if Biden is yeah. is who he's running against, then it's it writes itself. It's like, look at this obviously corrupt. Um, there's maybe some problems with his faculties, but maybe Trump won't want to contest it on that ground. But yeah, th this this guy is corrupt. I need to continue draining the swamp. You know, all of the the problems that we still face are because we have this um, sort of person who's who the Democrats think is they're going to be their presidential candidate. But you're saying, but wait, so you're saying, Nick, though, that you're saying that um, the the conservatism of um, of Democratic voters, essentially, their um, fixation with um, getting out Trump makes it very difficult for Bernie's campaign, particularly um, that it's the second iteration now after 2016. I mean, that's what you're saying. They don't want to risk another four years of Trump um, on Bernie. Yeah, I think that's, um, you know, I think there's, uh, yeah, I think that's, that. I think that's a very significant factor. Look, there's, and this brings me out to the point about sociology, right? Like, I, you know, I find myself, every time I hear Bernie's um, uh, stump speech, right, you know, and I was up in New Hampshire at the Victory Rally, you know, and um, it was very exciting. But every time I heard the stump speech, you know, it, it doesn't, I don't find it particularly inspiring because actually, if you look at the platform, um, you know, it's, it's, it's relatively conservative, right? Uh, it's, you know, a, a kind of social democratic model. The fact that, you know, the, that people involved in a campaign often look to Denmark as a kind of example is, is I think indicative of how relatively, you know, mainstream um, the camp the the actual pro the actual policies of the campaign are. Um, so, you know, I, I but I think I so I always have a tendency when I look at the campaign. I'm like, you know, why doesn't why isn't there a kind of you know universal idea of human freedom at work here? You know, if only Bernie would kind of adopt a Republican Labour. Um, you know, rhetoric and, and um, you know, try to uh, um, draw the divide in that way, you know, if that would be more effective. I actually, Alex, Alex Gorovich, your president. Well, you know, a, a chief speech writer, right? Chief speech writer, ideologue. Yeah. It's a terrifying vision. But, but you know, <laughs> I, I think my instinct is always to say, you're doing it wrong, you're doing it wrong, you're doing it wrong. And I think... You know, yes, there are campaign missteps, right? You know, yes, maybe there's an attempt to be all things to all people, right? That ends up kind of blunting the message in certain ways. And I think, you know, of course, you always have to be self-critical. But I also think we uh, we have to understand that this was a, an, an external environment, right? Partly because of the way that the Democratic Party operates and the way that they've understood the Trump period um, and their reaction to the Trump period um, that made this campaign, you know, very difficult, right? Very. Um, yeah, I think you know, I think this this context, as you were explaining it, that kind of anybody but Trump context of, I guess, risk aversity and um, I guess it, it it is it is difficult because it, you can see how clearly the anybody but Trump motivation, which probably starts in the the um, liberal establishment or the commentariat or the people who have really reacted in a quite visceral way to to Trump overturning their understanding of what politics is that anybody but Trump uh, framing leads inexorably to Trump 
it's negative it blames trump voters it it's sort of the response to that is well why not why not trump why why are you kind of basing your whole um political platform on um being against a candidate who who i voted for last time if you're if you're a trump voter um yeah and i think that kind of ties to what you were saying if there's no radical vision of an alternative sort of society if instead it's let's try and fight this this political battle against against trump that's that framing is always going to make it really difficult to have a really radical candidate yeah i think that's right and um you know to go back to um that kind of sociological perspective i think the way that you can overcome that, right? To, to overcome that, you need to do a couple of things. I think one is you need to meaningfully reach voters who are not voting, right? And this was a big campaign strategy. And, it, and I have to say, you know, there are, there are parts of the country where it's very successful, right? This kind of grassroots organizing is very successful, won them California, right? It won California. Um, but, I think, you know, that's very hard to reproduce all over the country in an electoral campaign, right? The kind of, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The kind of, um, you know, interaction, the kind of constant reinforcing interaction that you would need to have people with people to overcome their cynicism about the political process, right, takes time you know, takes organizing um, and um, it takes resources and, and probably needs to be organized around particular um, political issues as and, well. And, sorry, so and I guess that interaction to... is just a, an electoral one. I mean, you're basically asking yeah. for people's yeah. votes. Yeah. And if it needs to be a movement, if, if, if Bernie being a movement candidate is genuine, it needs to be more than that. It needs to have an existence Beyond that, it needs to be for in people's own self-interest, not just you would like to see this person president, but directed to community or labor organizing or whatever. And so, yeah, I'm also interested to hear like, what your experience about. So, but it goes. So it goes. But it goes back to what you were saying then, Nick, about your um, the cynicism that you encountered in the trailer park in New Hampshire was people who've just been disconnected from meaningful political. Um, decision-making, participation, interest and engagement for a very long time. And they're even surprised when you ask people um, what they care about. Um, and I guess, but that go, so there's two questions, I guess. Um, the first is, so why wasn't Bernie doing that for since 2016? Why weren't they building more of those kinds of linkages um, so that it wasn't um, so unusual just to be, or it wasn't um, just asking people out to come and vote in the primary when it came to 2020? And the second question is then, um, uh, you know, clearly you've you've thought you've thought um, seriously and um, for a long time about um, uh, the issues with the campaign, and you have to think about them because you're motivated to win it. Um, so, given these limits, though, what's um, what's the what is it about the democratic character of the campaign that still excites you and that still draws your support? Um, so I think uh, on the first point, look, you know where th now this speaks to Bernie's political instincts, right? Trump wins in 2016 and people were uh, absolutely, you know, to use the idiom, freaking out, right? People were, um, you know, really that Trump hysteria, uh, what is it, Trump derangement syndrome, you know, that had some truth to it. I mean, I knew some very level headed uh, lawyers who were really genuinely terrified that, you know, fascism was on its way, right? So, you know, what, what did Bernie do in that situation, right? He didn't, um, you know, he wasn't grandstanding on the TV, right? He went to West Virginia and did these town hall meetings with working class voters in West Virginia to talk about why they were voting for Trump. Right. And and to me that, you know, that is that's that's a great political instinct. Right. It's not to be it's not to retreat. Right. It's actually to engage. Um, and maybe this goes to your second point, too, about what I consistently and continue to find so 
um, you know, compelling about the campaign. So, um, you know, but there's a limit to the extent that you can do that if your ultimate goal is electoral, right? If if the goal of the campaign is to, um, you know, win the nomination for the presidency, and I should just say, I don't know what Bernie was thinking in 2016 when he went to West Virginia. I don't think he was planning another run, right? At least as far as I understand it, you know, I don't know when he formulated the idea, but I don't think he was um, actually consistently campaigning from 2016. But, you know, whether he was or not, you know, it's a, it, electoral politics is a different kind of engagement, right? You want somebody to do something, a particular thing, right, um, uh, you know, at, at a particular time and place. And, and what it's not is, um, you know, the kind of labor organizing or community organizing that Alex mentioned. Now, you know, so... To move on to Phil's second question, and I think, Alex, I think I saw you post something on Facebook, uh, you know, uh, probably a year ago at this point, which was, you know, typically electoral politics develops from some kind of social movement, or at least, mm. you know, when we think about left electoral politics, they're typically um, uh, the pro they're typically the end point of a process of developing some kind of social movement. Right. So the party is responding to a particular social movement. And obviously, in a way, Bernie's campaign has always been an attempt to put the cart before the horse. Right. So, you know, although I was not particularly, you know, the, the, the campaign platform and policies fall well short of what I would consider to be, um, you know, a kind of. Uh, even, you know, a, a really, it wouldn't be uh, considered particularly left wing in Europe, right? It's certainly, you know, uh, potentially it's more limited than what Boris Johnson promised in the last British election, right? <laughs> um, that's complicated. No, it's probably beyond that. But, but you know, it's, it's not that significantly left. But of course, um, in the particular context in which he's articulating it, right? And I give Bernie all credit for this, right? In the particular context in which he, he's articulating it, he recognizes the enormous political battle that would be engendered by um, attempting to impl implement even the relatively limited political reform and social and economic reforms that he is advocating. Right. So there was a really telling moment. Actually, and this comes back to something that I think George raised about distinguishing from the other candidates. So Bernie's on the stage in one of the early debates with this mass of candidates and everybody's talking about what they're going to do for health care. Right? Oh, we're going to have universal health care, universal health care. And Bernie just at one point, I, I wonder if something clicked in his head. At one point, he just looks at the camera and he says, I'm going to take on the insurance companies, you know, the big pharmaceutical interests and, you know, whatever else, and the, and the medical industry and bring about change, right? And so even on a policy like that, right, he, he recognizes that what he is um, uh, actually uh, going to, it, his limited policy platform is going to require an enormous political battle. And, you know, something that interested me about young voters, actually, which so and, and, and of course, that political battle, Phil, you asked like, you know, the, about what what kind of compels me, you know, even recognizing the limits of the campaign to continue. You know, that political battle, I think, would be truly, you know, how, I mean, now this is conjecture, right? But I think that political battle had the potential to be really transformative. Mm. Um, so, you know, in my head, I make, I think there's a strong analogy. Actually, I posted this on Facebook, um, you know, in, in a basic, in a kind of really facile troll um, in 2016. Um, you know, I said the analogy is, uh, um, you know, Hillary, this was a 20, 2015, I guess. Hillary is Remain, Bernie is Brexit, right? And of course, you know, Americans were like, what are you talking about? Because they weren't following the <laughs> referendum campaign. And then my British friends were, you know, for the most part, outraged, probably Phil um, <laughs> agreed, recognizing Bernie's social democratic tendencies. <laughs> um, but, 
But I do think there's an analogy there, right? Which is, um, you know, if we imagine bringing about universal health care in, in the U.S., right, in the face of what is a really significant economic interest of the insurance companies, the pharmaceuticals companies, right, even the hospitals, um, you know, that would require a really, it would require taking on um, and transforming the democratic and, and political institutions of the United States in certain ways. And I think, you know, that, that would be, that's, you know, that would be actually transformative and would really be both clarifying in U.S. politics, um, uh, at the very least clarifying and, you know, have this kind of tremendous uh, potential um, uh, in addition. Yeah, I mean, so I, 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 so just to just say, because I think we, I mean, amongst me, myself, uh, George and Phil probably have d- d- disagree somewhat on, on this, on, on the possibilities the Bernie campaign uh, promised. I mean, just on my part, I don't really have too much tr- problem uh, with the policies being limited, that the platform is a bit limited, because precisely for the reasons that you've said, um, that that would force that confrontation. But I think that always presumed uh, or required a level of intransigence from the Bernie campaign's part, that should he win the nomination, he should be willing to see this through or basically be willing to throw a bomb on the whole thing, um, that any compromise then kind of ends up uh, defeating the purpose. Because if you're compromising on already fairly limited social democratic policies, then what good is that? Then it's just you're yet another Democrat, which will breed yet more anti-establishment feeling, which will be generally capitalized upon by the right. So I think... That's where, for me, that's the pivot that, and that, where you decide whether, you know, this campaign really has it or not, is that level of intransigence, intransigence to pursue even what might be l- fairly limited policies precisely because of the difficulties of achieving those, as, as you've just described. Yeah, and I mean, but, you know, this is the, um, it's, a, it's a kind of unprovable hypothesis unless we do it, right? So, you know, I think... I think there's a, I think we need to distinguish a little bit between the democratic primary and the um, potential presidential campaign um, in the sense that I think, yeah, in the democratic primary, we've seen this compromise line towards the mainstream Democrats, um, you know, and uh, maybe a failure to kind of really force that split, right? That I think, you know, we, we all would have loved to see at times, right? or at least, well, I shouldn't say we all, you know, I'm speaking perhaps for you as the host of the podcast and myself, not for the general public. But, you know, we would have loved to see that kind of really um, open political conflict tape shape there. You know, I don't know, right? I don't know, um, you know, but I think, as we said, there are strategic reasons for maybe that not happening in the primary, right? I think where it would have been much... Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, much more appropriate would be in a pivot into the presidential election, right, um, where, you know, he's no longer beholden in quite the same way to the party, right, let alone should he, you know, and now it's so, so funny because a month ago, or rather, you know, I guess six weeks ago at this point, it seemed a real possibility. Now it seems so far-fetched. But, you know, if we imagine a, a Sanders presidency, what does that look like? You know, again, I think, we might have seen an ability to, you know, having kind of shaken off the shackles of the Democratic Party to actually really go um, at the establishment in a much more um, conflictual way. So, I mean, let's bring it to COVID then, because you mentioned that um, things have um, dramatically turned around as a result of COVID and that thing seemed what seemed um, possible six weeks ago. Sanders' presidency seems less likely now, given Biden's delegate count, but that anything can happen in politics and that you fully intend to win Rhode Island for Bernie. So um, let's try, I mean, you know, as difficult as it is, let's try and um, think through um, possible permutations of the impact of the COVID crisis. Um, You've mentioned already um, that your own primary in Rhode Island has been cancelled, delayed until early June now from uh, when it was supposed to be in late April. Do you think the COVID crisis is going to work in favour of Biden or of Bernie? Um, 
So I, I think it's going to work in favor of the status quo. Um, you know, I think we're going to see delegate counts probably that look, you know, or rather um, uh, voting, uh, polling rather, that looks very similar to um, what has happened so far. Um, you know, I think in a certain way, the race, the race, partly because of what happened on Super Tuesday, you know, and then I would say even more significantly um, with the loss in Michigan, um, you know, I think uh, the race was, um, you know, significantly tilted in Biden's favor. And I think almost we've entered a kind of um, state of suspended animation um, where, you know, not, I, I think actually in the race itself, not much will change. Um, because shouldn't, think, shouldn't COVID uh, make it, um, you know, the um, kind of go for broke approach with um, Bernie? Wouldn't that be more appealing in light of um, the dramatic kind of economic um, collapse, which is being brought about through COVID? So what the campaign is doing, which is, um, you know, is responding very directly to COVID. Right. So, um, you know, uh, the campaign has actually started to organize. So obviously they have a huge grassroots um, donor network. Right. And, you know, that in itself has been an incredible achievement of the campaign. Um, so they've raised, you know, millions of dollars from millions of people. Um, and they've actually directed that towards um, COVID relief. Uh, you know, um, so raising money for charities that are uh, um, trying to help those uh, who are caught up in the shutdown. Um, you know, and then beyond that, there's been a, a turn to uh, a kind of almost like a crisis politics. So, you know, I should say, you know, this is, to me, COVID has been quite problematic for the campaign in that it's driven a kind of, and this is not just the campaign, of course, this is all of politics now, is, is in this mode of being driven by the crisis, right? So, so, you know, all arguments now become oriented around the crisis. So the argument for universal health care becomes an argument about COVID-19 and our, uh, you know, responses to it. Um, so it's driven by necessity rather than by a kind of political calculation or um, a political argument. So, you know, and I think, but I think more than that, there's just no bandwidth right now for the primary, right? There's no bandwidth for the primary. So um, even Biden's kind of disappearance, you know, for a while, he was just making no public um, appearances after the last set of primaries. You know, even that, I think, just didn't really register in the national on a national scale. You know, since then, he's done a couple of really disastrous interviews. I mean, if you if you look them up, it's it's actually, you know, it's quite sad and, and shocking um, uh, when you hear him give these interviews because he does seem, you know, and I'm not going to feed into this discussion of his mental health, but he seems discombobulated and incoherent. Um, so, you know, but I don't think that's really registering because I think people are just so caught up in, in, in the COVID crisis um, that I'm not sure that much will, I'm not sure actually, although I haven't said everything's in play, I think actually in certain ways, this has slowed down um, uh, the politics of the primary. That's interesting. So kind of completely counterintuitive, I guess, on one level. So what do you expect to happen at the convention then? Um, I think uh, Biden will have, you know, he, he, he will probably have a majority of the delegates and he'll be uh, the Democratic nominee. It's the outside chance is that Biden completely falls apart and the Democratic establishment, and I'm sure you've all read this in, in the last few weeks, um, yeah. uh, you know, try to foist Cuomo or some other, you know, COVID yeah. hero on the party at the last minute. Yeah. You know, to be honest, um, you know, from a completely instrumental perspective, uh, you know, I... I'd be kind of intrigued to see him do it because I think it would be very much an unmasking, you know, be tearing off the veil and at least abandoning the democratic pretense. Um, so I think it would be good from a, you know, from yeah. a, an oppositional point of view, but obviously, you know, horrible, I mean, it set a, a terrible um, uh, uh, precedent in terms of democratic politics.
Yeah, I think that, I mean the 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 prop the proposition of a Biden versus Trump um, standoff, just in terms of providing political clarity, not in terms of winning or anything else or making people's lives better. You know, that's probably the worst possible option because at least you know Bloomberg would have been you know two two billionaires going up against each other, uh, and in fact you know. Bloomberg, a former Republican, uh, you know, I think there were there was lots of possibilities which would have been more interesting and more illuminating than Biden versus Trump. Um, but yeah, as you say, maybe that maybe parachuting someone else in really does lift the mask, uh, and would you know you would one would hope that that would allow an opportunity for Bernie to polemicize against the Democratic establishment, which was kind of what got him into the position in the first place in in 2016 as a serious proposition. Uh, with that in mind, I guess to, to wrap this up with a final question, and we're going to be asking this same question to everyone that we have on uh, to discuss the U.S. election, because I think it's probably the most pertinent one of all. Um, to what extent does the um, does the movement candidate label used for Bernie uh, stand? How, to what extent is that correct? And basically, and maybe to put this a little bit more bluntly, uh, will the will the Bernie Sanders movement be able to continue past Bernie and past this election? And in what form will that take? So I think, um, okay, I think on the one hand, does the does the label still stand? You know, yes, I think that's true, and I, I think that almost stands despite Bernie, right? Or I shouldn't say despite Bernie, he's not, you know, I think almost whatever he does, right, um, there will be some legacy from the campaign, just like there was in 2016, right? It doesn't really matter what Bernie does. You know, what this campaign has done is draw a lot of people into politics um, and engaged a lot of people in the political process. So I think there's a legacy almost not, not uh, notwithstanding uh, um, what he does. Yeah, I saw, and, and I think that's a legacy that, you know, I, okay, I think there's another potential um, tendency here, though, which is just, you know, to use your own language from the podcast, it's the, um, you know, the end of the end of history, right? So I think, you know, at the same time, there's also is a re-engagement with the political process going on. And that's why I say almost despite Bernie, right? What would we have seen after 2015? You know, did did Bernie Sanders running in 2015 really inspire this re-engagement with politics? Yes, in part, but obviously there was other trends already going on um, that have, um, you know, essentially um increased people's engagement with the democratic process. And that's obviously an, a, an international trend, not just in the United States. So I think there's no, you know, almost whatever Bernie does, there's no way to put this genie back in the bottle. And to the extent that he, um, but of course, as a, per, as a prominent person within this political moment, he has shaped discussion. And that was, of course, really apparent in the fact that his policy platform was widely um, taken up by other candidates in the race um, or uh, aspects of his policy platform, but also that um, his language of this kind of political struggle and, you know, in his language, the political revolution, right, um, influences people who become active in this process. Um, and I'd say, you know, to me, that's Whatever happens in the primary, right? So let's assume he goes down in flames. Let's assume he um, uh, endorses um, Biden. You know, it, I don't think that really matters. I think that that kind of language becomes part of our political experience and, and shapes our political engagement. So I just want to say one thing, you know, and this goes to maybe the, um, you know, my analogy to Brexit, which is, you know, the one, the, 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 the thing that I have you know, and also why it be involved in the campaign in the first place. Now, the thing that's really engaging about the Bernie campaign is it is not cynical. Um, and it's not cynical about the democratic process. And it's not cynical about voters, right? Uh, if I think about Remain, the Remain campaign in the UK with its kind of very outward hostility um, towards uh, Brexit voters, um, you know, there is none of that within the Bernie campaign. 
Um, and obviously, you know, there's a lot of discussion about Bernie Bros. People are people are passionate. You know, people obviously are not nuanced online and, and say um, unpleasant things. But in a way, what's interesting about the Bernie campaign is it starts from a point of empathy with, um, you know, people who voted for Trump, right? Because it's the Democratic establishment who engages in those kind of remain type discussions, um, you know, full of misanthropy about, um, you know, working class or uh, what's the other term they use, low information voters, et cetera. Um, so I think, you know, there's a kind of dem spirit of democratic engagement um, that uh, will outlast the campaign um, and almost outlast Bernie himself. Uh, well, you know, hopefully will outlast Bernie himself, but also, um, uh, uh, but also um, uh, does take partly its form from his particular politics, uh, which obviously reflect, you know, a long political tradition in the United States that is highly democratic um, and, uh, you know, very, very positive. Okay, excellent stuff. I mean, hopefully it is able to carry on and sustain itself beyond Bernie. Uh, the experience uh, across Europe has been, you know, mixed to say the least in terms of uh, various left populist experiments uh, and the sheer weight of the United States means that it does really matter to everyone else what actually happens there. So thank you very much, Nick, for talking us through all Yeah, that. thank you very much. You're very welcome. It, it was a pleasure. Excellent. And uh, we'll be back, as I said, uh, maybe in a month or so time to delve a little bit more deeply, uh, ask some different questions and to be another opportunity to push these questions a little bit further forward. Catch you next time. Bye bye.